Hi, I'm Samantha McGalrick, and you are in the right place if you are a director or CEO leading safe and healthy work in the boardroom or C-suite. Joining a board of any organization is a big deal. I'm particularly attuned to this in my profession because under workplace health and safety legislation in Australia, New Zealand, the UK and Canada, there is personal liability for company officers, which of course includes directors. There are plenty of tools out there to assist you in your due diligence, but very little on what to look for in terms of workplace health and safety. So when you're actively seeking to join a board of directors or you have been approached to join a board, there are a few things you should consider. These considerations may not keep you out of trouble if something does go wrong, but they will most definitely keep you more informed of what you're walking into, and that is how I can best serve you. My goal, as always, is to help you know what to ask and when to act. Technically, a director joining a board today will not be responsible for decisions made prior to their joining. However, problems may arise in the future as a result of those earlier decisions. And there are plenty of examples of serious health and safety incidents that show that's the case. Pike River mine explosion, NASA's Challenger disaster, BP's Texas City oil refinery explosion in 2005, and its Macondo blowout five years later. All of the investigations into these tragedies identified warning signs. During the interview process, the board may not think to tell you of these things. They may not realize the relevance of these issues, or there is always the possibility they may avoid providing this information. If you're not prepared as to what to ask, then you may not get the chance to act. Not only will the questions I've outlined today help you in your due diligence prior to joining the board, but they will also help you fulfill your legal, your legal responsibilities once you're in the hot seat. So it's a win-win. I remember being at an AICD forum where one of the directors mentioned that she wasn't told of the depth of difficulties the company was in until she was on the board. Now she may not have asked the questions you might have asked, or maybe she didn't ask for documentation that would have given her a better perspective of what was happening. But once you're on the board, it may not be that easy to get off. So why put yourself in that position? Let's just get you ready for, to lead safe and healthy work in the boardroom from the get-go. The bottom line is, it's your job to know about risks, and once you're on the board, you'll be responsible for them. So today is about helping you identify any red flags so you can make an informed decision whether to proceed or not. So let's get started. The first question that I suggest you ask will give you an understanding of the organization's health and safety performance. Ask whether, whether there has been any fatalities and follow that up with what are the types of serious injuries and illnesses the organization experiences. Every year, over 150 people die at work, and I bet each one of those directors had no idea that they were staring down a future fatality. So when you're conducting your due diligence, what you're trying to understand is what makes this organization any different to those that suffered a fatality. If you're a board member of an organization that suffers a fatality or a serious injury or illness, you will have to deal with the aftermath including a decrease in trust levels from employees towards management, lower productivity, decreased job satisfaction, poor safety performance, and overall increased risks of mental ill health for workers and management. After a fatality, people tend to analyze in their own heads whether the organization had adequately supported workplace safety, health and safety practices. And we commonly hear after incidents that there were complaints about particular work issues but they were ignored, which leads to the decrease in trust as to whether management really care about workplace health and safety. When trust levels decline, there's a plenty of research out there that links to a decrease in productivity, job satisfaction, employee engagement, and these are important components to positive health and safety performance and your overall bottom line. But they will also impact the level of traction you get in implementing your strategy. From a personal point of view, it would be tragic to know a fatality happened under your watch. From a legal perspective, you will have to go through a storm of interrogation from the regulator and the families of the victims. You'll be under siege in court proceedings, if that's where it goes. And what about your reputation in your professional and personal circles? Will other boards want you to join their board based on where you've been? What do dinner parties look like when everyone there knows that you're on the board of that organization where that really horrible tragedy happened. 
In light of the Royal Commission into Australia's banking and financial sectors, how easy do you think it's going to be for the ex-chair of AMP to find a new board position? How long will the findings of the Commission haunt her director prospects? I suggest for you to be informed. Ask about the safety performance of the organization, particularly if and when there have been any fatalities or serious injuries or illnesses. Remember that illness may be in the form of mental health. I'm sure you're all well across by now that mental health is a serious risk to any business. We've got research that suggests one in five people will experience a mental health illness and the workplace plays a big role in the types of hazards that create mental ill health or cause mental ill health. Some of the indicators to look for if the organization does not think they have a risk of mental health are what is the typical time off work? Research suggests the typical time off work for work-related mental disorders was close to 15 weeks compared to five weeks for all claims. Look for claims caused by work pressure and work-related harassment or bullying or exposure to occupational violence or a traumatic event. So why is all of this important? Well, having an understanding of the prospective organization's health and safety performance will put you on notice as to the challenges you may be up against in terms of health and safety culture and climate. And these are not quick fixes. The second question I suggest you focus on is getting an understanding of the maturity of the organization's health and safety governance. You will want to ask the board for documentation that outlines their approach to health and safety governance. Health and safety governance is the relationship between board members and senior executives in leading safe and healthy work. It provides the structure through which the vision and commitment are set and demonstrated. It provides agreement on how health and safety objectives are to be attained. It provides the framework for how monitoring performance is to be established. And it provides a means for ensuring compliance with relevant health and safety legislation. Every organization moves along a continuum as they develop their health and safety governance framework. To help identify where a board is on that continuum, a five-stage research-based health and safety governance pathway has been developed. The further along the pathway the organization is, the more informed the board will be in terms of its governance role and the more mature their approach will be to leading safe and healthy work from the boardroom. If you don't have a clear indication of where the organization you're prospecting sits on that pathway, here are some indicators of both an immature and mature approach to health and safety governance. A board with an immature, or as the pathway suggests, a transactional or compliant approach to health and safety governance will, for example, not have defined or documented how it will govern health and safety. This is commonly documented in a board charter. The board refers to the organization's health and safety performance in terms of how many lost time injuries they've experienced. This is the main indicator, perhaps, on their performance reports. Lost time injuries, or LTIs, should not be used as a measure of how well an organization is doing at keeping workers healthy and safe. It is a measure of productivity. For example, the more time you have people off work, the greater the impact to productivity. An immature health and safety governance structure, um, there is, there's also no director induction. Or there is, but it just covers health and safety legislation. There's no strategy for workplace health and safety as well, and I'm talking about a three to five year plan that outlines the organization's objectives and identifies their top risk programs. Health and, and finally, health and safety is not mentioned in the CEO's position description and executive incentives are not linked to the organization's health and safety strategic objectives or elements of the system. However, a board with a mature, focused, proactive or integrated approach to health and safety governance will likely have, for example, a board subcommittee for health and safety, or at the very least, health and safety is specifically mentioned in another subcommittee, for example, the risk committee. Workers are represented in strategic committees. There are lead and lag indicators in performance reporting. There is an induction for directors into the health and safety governance framework. Those organizations that go even further along the pathway would have further professional development training provided to directors in health and safety governance and leadership. And there has been an independent external review of workplace health and safety. 
By identifying the maturity of the board's health and safety governance and leadership, you will get an appreciation of the board's appetite for progressive and effective leadership of safe and healthy work. Some of you may have your work cut out for you. Your third question ties into whether the board understands their health and safety due diligence obligations. Officer due diligence obligations are a legislative requirement in most workplace health and safety legislation in Australia. And where it's not, it would certainly be used in the courts as better practice. The obligations are also a legal requirement in New Zealand. While due diligence is not clearly outlined in workplace health and safety legislation in countries like Canada, the UK or the USA, the due diligence obligations in Australia and New Zealand are just better practice for directors. Every director should consider how they adhere to these six due diligence obligations regardless of their global jurisdiction. One way to see if the board is familiar with their due diligence obligations is to ask them whether they know their top three to five critical risks. You don't want to hear that they have a lot of slips and trips or cuts and abrasions. While these are issues and certainly need to be addressed, what you are looking for is whether the board knows what are the organization's risks that can kill people or cause harm to multiple people. And this includes musculoskeletal disorders and mental health. While knowing the risks is a start and a due diligence requirement, if the board can identify the controls they're monitoring to prevent or minimize those risks, you're, you'll really get an appreciation of how well the board understands director due diligence obligations and how seriously they take those obligations. You'll notice that I mentioned that there are six obligate due diligence obligations. Knowing your risks is just one of them, but it's a good one to start with. If the board doesn't know these risks and or the controls to monitor them, then at least you're put on notice as to one of the first health and safety activities you're going to want to do once you join the board. So let's recap. The three questions I would ask any board prior to joining. One, has there been a fatality in the business? If so, how many and when? And follow that up with what are the types of serious injuries and illnesses they experience? Two, ask to review documentation that outlines their approach to health and safety governance. Three, ask the board what are their top three to five critical risks. If they know those, ask them what controls they have in place to prevent or minimize those risks. Once you know this, I would suggest you take this extra step to see whether these controls are monitored in their board performance reports. That of course, they'll be showing you as part of the documentation they provide you with when answering question two. So there you have it. I hope these are three questions that empower you to make an informed decision as to whether to join a prospective board. When you finish watching, I'd like to know, are there any elements of health and safety governance that you have found useful to know prior to joining a board or wish you would have known earlier? Leave a comment below and let me know. If you like this video, be sure to give me a thumbs up. And if you want a regular dose of what to ask and when to act, hit that subscribe button. If you're interested in diving further into content like this, head over to my blog on smsafetysolutions.com.au. While you're there, be sure to sign up for my newsletter to get notified of more good stuff on health and safety governance and leadership promotions and other insights, tips and strategies that I only share via email. As always, I hope I have contributed further to you knowing what to ask and when to act. Thanks for watching. Until next time.